episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest, helping to uh, create a better tomorrow for all of us on some extremely important fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Craig Fugate, uh, who was a former administrator of the United States uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, known as FEMA, which is, uh, for our non-U.S. listeners, part of the United States Department of Homeland Security, uh, which is an organization with the primary purpose to uh, coordinate the response to various disasters that occur in the United States and which ultimately overwhelm local and state authorities. He's also the former director of the Florida Division of Emergency Management. Uh, Craig currently uh, serves as the chief emergency management officer of a company called One Concern, uh, which is a resilience as a service solutions company that brings uh, disaster sciences uh, together with machine learning for ultimately better decision making. Uh, he is also a senior advisor at an uh, organization, Blue Dots strategies where he assists a range of clients with emergency management implementation strategies and crisis communication. Uh, in addition to all that, he sits on the board of Directors PG and E Corporation, one of the largest electric and natural gas utilities in the U.S. Uh, he lectures at Indian uh, River State College, uh, serving as a strategic consultant in emergency management, and he literally has decades of experience local, state, and federal levels, of course, in disaster preparedness and management is overseen uh, preparation and response for uh, everything from wildfires, hurricanes, health crises, and various national security threats. Uh, and then just uh, during his time in Florida, uh, Director of Emergency Management, he oversaw the big four uh, back in 2004, uh, Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and Gene hurricanes. Uh, and as the administrator for FEMA, he organized the recovery efforts for a record 87 disasters in 2011. Alone, uh, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, Craig Fugate, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us today. Thanks for having me back. It, it's great to see you again. You know, I'd love to start off as we did last time, especially for this new audience. Just uh, if you could give a couple minutes uh, of your background and a little bit of the journey that took you from uh, firefighting early in your career to uh, managing the uh, the top emergency uh, management organization with this thirty billion dollar budget, it'd be a great way to start off. Well, I got started as a volunteer firefighter, um, became a EMT and a paramedic, did fire rescue for a number of years and had an opportunity at the local level to uh, uh, update and review the county's disaster plan. Um, I live in North Florida, Gainesville, uh, County's Lodge was the University of Florida. And as I began doing that, I, I really got interested in the disaster space. And I, I got into the business at an interesting time frame. Um, we were still looking at uh, population relocation plans for nuclear attack. That was still part of the job description. At the same time, we were implementing a brand new program uh, that was coming out of EPA called Sarah Title III, or uh, the, you know, the Extremely Hazardous Material Substance uh, Act, as we began planning now for chemical facilities after several. So it was beginning to recognize uh, this transition from uh, planning for nuclear attack uh, to this all hazard to now including technological uh, chemical emergencies. And uh, that was in 1987. And uh, I worked my way up uh, to the state of Florida in 97. Uh, Governor Bush appointed me director in 2001. Uh, you know, September 11th had happened. Uh, we were now dealing with the new Homeland Security Enterprise, but we were seeing primarily the impacts of natural hazards in 2004. We got hit by four hurricanes and by the time the Obama administration came in, um, you know, I was again working for then Governor uh, Charlie Crisp, and uh, the administration approached me about joining them. So uh, the interesting thing is, I never really looked to move to the next level or apply for the next level. I got I got phone calls saying, "Hey, would you be interested?" And the timing was right. And I was fortunate I had opportunity. So, you know, I ended up at FEMA and I uh, served in both uh, in terms of the administration, and then left at the end of that. And uh, went back and, you know, joined the private sector. Outstanding. Outstanding. And, you know, as, as I was you know, mentioning in your bio, you, you've clearly – um, overseen uh, your uh, you know, a collection of, of severe disasters that our country has experienced. Um, however, the last couple of years uh, have been pretty rough in terms of hurricanes, wildfires, 
major pandemic and so forth. Um, just from your experience, you know, you've been doing this for over 30 years. Have we ever been here before? Or, or is, it, is this the worst that it's gotten? Or are there times in the past that we might not remember that uh, it was this bad? Uh, just give us your, your top level perspective on sort of where we are approaching 2022 in this disaster uh, scheme of things. Yeah, outside of war, you don't see the type of impacts we've been seeing. Um, you know, we just surpassed the uh, influenza deaths in 1917, 1918 with COVID-19, and it's still ongoing. Um, the interesting thing is we have good weather data going back to the 1850s when President Grant established the uh, Weather Bureau as part of the Army Signal Corps. So when people say record-setting events, think about it. We have data going back to the 1850s. We have things that are occurring that we have never measured mm -hmm. until now. Yeah, that's a, it's a unique situation, unique world we're in, um, you know, which brings me into uh, this topic, which, you know, is very near and dear to you, very important. And it's this sort of principle of resilience. Uh, and this is a theme that you know, we talked about battle on the show, you know, in the past, primarily from a healthcare perspective, we think of uh, physical resilience, the ability to, to bounce back from injuries and diseases. Obviously, you focus on resilience from a much larger level, looking at uh, society as a whole, uh, cities, uh, so, and so forth. Uh, talk about sort of what resilience means to you when thinking about disaster preparedness and society. Well, the first thing it doesn't mean is that we don't have impacts. Uh, I think that's the big confusion when people talk about being resilient is, well, we don't get impacted. That's not true. We're not going to stop uh, the climate impacts that have already started. The uh, climate has already changed. The record setting events continue. Uh, if we look back to where our infrastructure was built, how we built it, how our societal uh, functions are set up, our response systems, they were always built upon the last you know, 100 years. Uh, they're not doing well going forward. And I think there's a good analogy when we talk about community resiliency and we talk about health. They're very similar, uh, especially if you look at trauma and how trauma impacts a person. It also has similar impacts on the community. So that's, I think, when we talk about resiliency, I, I know some people, they focus on uh, critical infrastructure. They talk about the power system, the water system. You know, we've seen how power impacts the response in Ida, we saw how it impacted uh, the severe cold temperatures that we were seeing in Texas earlier this year. Uh, but I tend to look at the people and the impacts they have on that. And how do you make people more resilient to the more extreme events? And, you know, this is something I think that as we talk about disasters, we always talk about mitigation. We talk about you know, making investments and getting a return on that investment of one to four dollars, one to six dollars. Some people go as high as one to nine dollars. But we don't always clearly state how that impacts the vulnerable populations and reduces their impacts and increases their survival rates. What, um, you know, you, you at one concern you focus, you know, sort of broadly on. Uh, so it's termed disaster sciences, you're, you're promoting a resilience as a service solution, you bring together a lot of these uh, sort of really cutting edge tools that we, we've talked about sort of independently on the show, artificial intelligence, machine learning, but also, you know, there's a very interesting thing on your website where it talks about you're creating a digital twin for the world. Uh, now, digital twin is something, again, we've, we've talked about on the show from healthcare, uh, how we can create sort of this digital twin of a human and like analyze. Uh, blood flow and, 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 and diseases and so forth. Here, your, your digital twin is much larger. And you're sort of trying to recreate uh, all bad things that could happen in the world and, and, and predict them. Talk about how you're merging together with all these really cutting edge tools, digital twins, artificial intelligence to, to help predict and, 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 and prevent these, or not prevent, but uh, keep us more resilient in the future. Well, the idea is if you're able to recreate the environment uh, that we live in uh, and look at everything from points on the map structures, but also dependencies and interconnectedness. Uh, you know, a hospital that survives doesn't do the community any good if the bridge that gets there goes out. So it's creating that uh, almost like a sim city, an mm -hmm. alternative that's based upon the communities we want to look at. 
and then applying the trauma, in this case, to natural hazards, and seeing what the sensitivity is. Again, a simple example is flooding. Now, this is probably the clearest signal we're seeing in climate impacts today. Uh, it is extremely dangerous, as we saw in New York City, from the remnants of Ida, the flooding that occurred, uh, record setting. And the problem is, if we're continuing to see record-setting events, and we built our infrastructure for the past, we're not able to go fix everything immediately. You know, we got to start somewhere. So how do you prioritize? And one of the ways you could do that with a digital twin is take these events and don't just go upon the 100-year frequency of recurrence or past data, but just go, I just want to keep filling the bathtub up and see what breaks, floods, or gets shut down first and look at sensitivities. And do that in a way that it looks at not only what is happening to the physical environment, but how's that impacting the community? And taking a, uh, a, a look at uh, where the vulnerabilities occur. And this is something we observe in disasters. It should not be surprising to your listeners. But if you look at the heat maps or where the greatest number of fatalities occur uh, during COVID, and you look at disasters and the loss of life, they are very similar. Hmm. Uh, I use the term heat maps, but that, that's, you know, some people, meteorologists kind of get uh, sideways with that. But if you look at temperature impacts, both extreme cold and extreme heat events where people die, and you look at where people have died from COVID, and you look at those layers, you also start seeing patterns. So we know that the lower incomes, historically communities of color, communities of migrants, uh, low income areas, are disproportionately impacted by the same event as more affluent parts of the community. So these are things that we want to recreate in the digital twin and look at the sensitivity to events and just don't go by what's happened, but go by what could happen and how vulnerable is a community to extreme events, which you know, people will say, I've lived here all my life. It's never been that bad until it is. And, you know, I've heard you, you know, talk in the past, you know, when we normally think, of course, of, of these major disasters, we talk about some of them, the hurricanes, the wildfires, you know, national security threats. Um, but we have a topic like COVID. Um, obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, uh, this public health thing and this public health challenge. But I've heard you talk about, you know, it's, it's much bigger than that, as we're, as we're all learning now, uh, when the supply chains go down and things don't get to us, uh, when the economy collapses and we need to uh, keep it running. Um, talk a little bit about sort of the role of organizations, well, like what we were doing at FEMA, but also some of what you're doing now in uh, taking care of, of this other stuff because it's equally, you know, important to be able to to predict and and, and, and balance and and once again, uh, God forbid, but if the next COVID does come along at some point, that we are prepared on multiple sides for it. Well, you're being optimistic. We'll be prepared because, unfortunately, in our history is we'll spend a lot of money during the event and then we won't beef up the defenses after the event's over. Um, that's a problem with public health. But if you think about disasters and you think about COVID, uh, they share some characteristics, but they're different than other. One is most disasters are geographically focused. The Hurricane Ida hit, you know, you could draw the line between where it made landfall in Louisiana to it exited the coast uh, and the Northeast and all the damage in between. But it was geographically focused. It wasn't happening in China. It wasn't happening in Europe. It wasn't happening on the West Coast. And that means you're able to then you know, it defines itself. You're able to bring resources from the outside and ultimately work to get the areas of impact reduced down, primarily when you get power turned back on, then you're down to the areas that actually have physical damages. Uh, pandemics don't work that way. Pandemics, by definition, are borderless, and they're probably occurring multiple points across the globe when the World Health Organization declares a pandemic. They don't declare it because it's in one place. So now we start seeing everything from the impacts of the disease itself, and then the consequences of that, and again, supply chain disruptions, uh, on a scale that nobody was really, I think, anticipating, but we had actually thought about this. This is, uh, I think the other tragedy was, this wasn't something that we didn't know could happen, and there wasn't already some beginning understanding of that, uh, but as with most things, the resources would get cut, uh, the emphasis would go elsewhere, uh, and when it came back, it, it showed it. But if you think about outside of, of war, the types of disasters that are borderless uh, are disease outbreaks, 
And we always talk about people, but we can have the same type of things with both crops and livestock disease outbreaks. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see this with cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. And again, this goes beyond ransomware, but the ability of peer adversaries and, and as we continue to advance our dependencies upon uh, the internet, it increases our vulnerabilities. And so again, these would be uh, potentially portals. And then there are certain natural phenomena like geomagnetic storms that can cause havoc over at large segments. And so again, it's a, a different type of response. You're not able to concentrate all your resources. You may have multiple countries, in the US multiple states being hit simultaneously in the case of COVID. Uh, what's interesting is it does a lot like we saw with the influenza outbreak in 1917, 1918. Everybody didn't get hit hard at the same time. Mm. But it tended to move around the country. So you've got a little bit of resources you can shift, but by and large, the supply chain and our dependencies on overseas uh, supply chains made us very vulnerable to single point failures. And this was really evident in the very beginning was with just with PPE. Yeah. We didn't have enough domestic production and we were in a worldwide competition. It took us a while. Now we're at the point where it's readily available. Uh, so now the big race is testing and vaccinations. And so, again, as we ramp up for that, uh, we'll build this capability. Ultimately, you know, the goal is to vaccinate the, the globe because no one's safe in the U.S. until everybody has gotten vaccinated to the point where it just stops spreading and mutating. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there'll be another one. That's what we do know about pandemics. There will yeah. always be another pandemic. Hopefully not soon. <laughs> um, Great. You, you were just mentioning, um, you know, this concept of the, of the, of the borderless uh, disaster, um, and, it, and it, of course, it got me thinking. And, and I've read some some of the stuff you talked about in in terms of, you know, our border. We we have border issues on, on different fronts. One going on right now. Um, I, I don't do policy or politics on this show, but could you say a few things about? Uh, you were pointing out uh, in this presentation about how you know those are obviously local issues of the states that are at the border, but at the same time, organizations uh, like FEMA and so forth need to support uh, those states when they're overwhelmed. Uh, talk a little bit about sort of what you see in terms of uh, the border and some of what uh, technologies and, and and thinking can be brought to bear on uh, those types of situations, if you would. The problem is and when we're focused on the border, we're behind. Mm -hmm. Nobody really talks about the, the issue of why people are trying to get here. Haiti's uh, economy doesn't exist. They've been hit by multiple disasters. They've had a toppled government. Uh, Haitians had been fleeing that country for uh, a long time. And again, when there's a signal that policies may be changing, we get a surge on the border. We have the same thing out of Central America. Uh, we've never really, as a nation, uh, put the focus on what it would take to stabilize. I mean, th think about it. A lot of these people, yes, coming here is for a better life. But that doesn't drive the numbers we're seeing. They're fleeing conflict. They're fleeing crime. They're fleeing, in some cases, natural hazards that uh, you know, hurricanes that have hit Central America that here very few people pay attention to. And... You know, if we're only focused on the economic drivers, I think we're missing the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. uh, we're likely to see more increased migrations uh, due to climate impacts. And uh, this is just a sampling of what we could be seeing. And, and again, if we're only focused at the border uh, and you listen to these people's story, what they're fleeing, you think a fence is going to stop them. You're, 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 you're rather not you. Uh, and I think that's the other problem is there's too many people say, we need to focus on the border. We need to focus on the border. Like you need to focus on why people are coming here mm -hmm. and address those issues. Otherwise you can build the fence as high as you can. They'll just go under it like the drug dealers do. What is um, hopping back now to a, a borderless issue? You brought up cyber. Um, what are your concerns on that front? Obviously we saw the, uh, the pipeline issues, uh, last year um concerns about cyber is one of the things that uh in sort of the uh, the list of things that you think about is it one of the things that keeps you up at night more than others because it's sort of a, a nebulous uh thing uh, but uh or not talk, talk a little bit about your your thoughts and what you do in terms of the cyber area if you could well to be honest with you nothing keeps me up at night except for coffee but uh the things that I don't think people get about cyber is we have moved beyond the criminal element. Uh, you know, we're hearing a lot about ransom attacks. We're hearing, you know, about all this other stuff. 
And I think there's this tendency to think that this is hackers, disorganized criminal groups, and don't understand uh, cyber attacks are actually a weaponized tool that nations can use against each other. And they'll use it in conflict. And we've seen this. Uh, this has already happened in the uh, 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 Russian conflict with Georgia. We've seen this in the Ukraine. Uh, we've done it. The Israelis have done it uh, very clumsily, but even the North Koreans have done it. Uh, we have uh, nations, which I would call our frenemies. We're, we, we're on terms, but we also have significant cyber risk. And if you think about it from the standpoint of today's world, that you can disrupt and basically take out the ability of a nation to deal with a crisis by creating more crisis. So let's say there's a conflict with an unnamed country uh, that we are increasing tensions and they want to uh, distract the US, they attack the power grid. So this is no longer the realm of the criminal. Mm -hmm. And you know, from the standpoint of emergency management, we, we kind of, I, I kind of say, look folks, we're not the cyber sleuths, we're not building the, the, the protection systems. What we have to do is be able to operate and deal with the consequences of this event. And, you know, with that FEMA, I started pushing back on our increasing dependence upon technologies and going, what happens if that goes out? You know, what happens if you lose the internet? What happens if GPS gets jammed? Uh, you know, we had an entire generation that still do that don't know how to read a map. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even the Defense Department realized that they had grown a whole generation of junior officers that had never done map reading. They were so used to GPS. So both the Army reinstituted land navigation, the Naval Academy uh, got out the sextants and started teaching the midshipmen how to read the stars because we were creating single points of failure on technology. And so from the standpoint of the consequent management size, uh, I always start out with, you know, people start out with power ups. That's bad, but what would really be crippling is if they took down the internet. <laughs> and then what are you going to do then? <laughs> I know what my kids wouldn't do. <laughs> um, Craig, essentially in, in the bio, you a couple months ago, you started um, lecturing um, at uh, Indian River State College. Uh, you're, you're talking about emergency management, planning, threat assessment. Um, Talk a little bit about sort of the types of courses you're teaching, the types of students, and, and then um, for, for some of the younger audience that is, is just starting out their careers, what are some of the options? I mean, obviously, you can go to work for FEMA. Uh, what are some of the other areas that, um, that sort of the next generation is looking to get involved in that you're seeing in your classrooms? Well, again, a lot of what we're, we're talking, the folks we talk to are people that are already in public safety and are looking to get okay. to move up in their careers. Uh, but uh, I was given the opportunity uh, Indian River State College to start uh, uh, redesigning and looking at things. And so one of the one of the courses, for a fact, we're going to do our first pilot here in the, the beginning of October, is uh, something that based upon uh, I used to do these no notice exercises called thunderbolts uh, that mm -hmm. we just go in with no prior warning and just drop a scenario on the team and say now deal with it. Uh, because usually outside of hurricanes, not a lot of things come with a uh, you know, you're going to have a, an earthquake uh, a week from now, so you, you have time to get ready. Like, it happens, now what do you do? And uh, and I've asked people, and, and there's a lot of great programs out there, all the way from uh, teaching emergency management and offering degrees to, you know, the Naval Postgraduate School and the Harvard Centers for, you know, advanced studies and stuff. They're teaching a lot of theory. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, the problem is for most people, their first big disaster is their first big disaster. And most exercises I find are not really challenging people or teaching them critical thinking. Um, and so I just wanted to do a series of increasing exercises with, with folks and, and put them in different roles and take them out of their comfort zone and not so much come up with all the answers, but get them thinking of how they got to act in a disaster where you don't have time, you don't have all the information, and by the time you have the information, it's too late. And you have to make decisions, which may be good or bad, but failure to make a decision is also a decision. And it's really just getting people in that environment. And so uh, primary focus is, you know, the folks there in the immediate region of Florida, uh, helping them get prepared for the next big event, whatever that may be. 
Excellent. Um, Craig, I have to, once again, <laughs> As we chatted last time, bring up the, the topic of uh, you, the indexes that you've created. Uh, you're, you know, quite well known for the Waffle House Index, which is this metric uh, you put together uh, while you were at FEMA in terms of uh, determining uh, the effects of, of a storm and the, the degree of assistance uh, that would be required. I think you, at the time you were also, uh, last chat, you, were, you created a, something similar, a Starbucks Index, because you were talking about how the, the water uh, comes into the Starbucks, uh, which if that was destroyed during an earthquake, the coffee wouldn't run and so forth. Um, any other interesting indexes that you've come up with uh, over the last couple of years that you can share with us or anything new on the, these informal metric fronts? Yeah, you know, I guess if you're in Canada, it's the Tim Hortons index. And if you're in the North, okay. it's just the Dunkin' Donut index. <laughs> it's really the whole thing about the, the Waffle House index. Um, you know, we were down in Hurricane Charlie. Uh, uh, the, the two guys that actually did the first draft of this and came up with this idea was Ben Nelson, our state meteorologist, and Tad Warfel, who was then a major in the Florida National Guard. We were downrange trying to find breakfast, and that kind of was the evolution of the Waffle House Index. But what it really does is it's sort of like, and again, my background is a paramedic, is, is you, you show up on a trauma patient. Uh, you don't try to assess everything. You just don't have time. Uh, so you go, what are, what are your key vital signs? And I look at stores like Waffle House, which I know if they can get open, they're going to get open. But in general, if you look at what businesses normally get up quickly, it starts telling you a lot of the vital signs. Think about it. If you can get a Waffle House open or if you can get a, uh, a Starbucks open, the first thing means there's enough passable roads for staff to get there. Mm -hmm. The second thing is the buildings are intact, so we don't have total devastation. And then their degree of how they're providing services will also go back to the infrastructure. And, you know, some are, are much more resilient and have workarounds and will get up. Uh, but again, they're like vital signs. You know, if I'm, if I'm driving down the road and, uh, you know, I see a line at Starbucks, even though I'm dealing with a lot of devastation, I already know there's a lot of things that are working because, you know, Starbucks, they, all of their uh, uh, systems are pre-plumbed, so they don't really have the ability, like a Waffle House, to make wa make coffee by pouring water into the coffee maker. Mm -hmm. um, but that at least means the water system has pressure and it's potable. Uh, but it, it's, again, these ideas that they're not telling you everything, and it doesn't mean there's not impacts that may be worse in some areas than there. But it is a vital sign saying, hey, at least it's, you know, if they're closed, that's really not good. But if they're open or what degree they're open, it starts telling you some things about the community overall impact. Excellent. Um, Craig, you, you've, uh, you, you've run through a lot of different topics with us. Um, anything else coming up uh, per 2022? Any conferences, lectures you're going to be giving, other things we should be on the lookout in terms of either Craig Fugate, One Concern, other initiatives you're involved in? Yeah, I do a lot of different speaking. And uh, again, I, I'm out there a lot. But I think probably the one topic that um, I've been trying to get people to focus on is, you know, we've heard this term managed retreat and we've heard okay. the term climate refugees. Okay. And people are thinking this is something that's going to happen in the future. I'm like, no, it's not. It's happening right now. Okay. And it's not a managed retreat. It's an unorganized retreat. And the climate refugees today are based upon lack of affordable housing. And if you look at what happened last year in Louisiana, uh, Lake Charles region got hit with two hurricanes. You look at what happened this year with Ida. You look at the California wildfires. You look at flooding across the country. The type of housing we're losing that doesn't come back mm -hmm. are lower income homes and lower income rental properties. And people with insurance are rebuilding and usually rebuilding to higher value. But people that are underinsured who do not have insurance or people who rent are finding it increasingly difficult to find somewhere to live. And we're losing affordable housing at an unsustainable rate. And it's not really a mystery. We know that a lot of the lower income rental properties are actually older, uh, probably not built to code, probably not well maintained, mm -hmm. not really an interest for their owners to put a lot of resources in there because they're not making any money off it. They're barely, you know, rent's probably just covering some of the stuff and they make a little profit. But when that gets wiped out, they're not going to go back and build something that they're going to be able to rent that cheap because when they rebuild, it's going to have they're going to, have to they're going to, have to charge more just to be able to make back their investment if they yeah. even are able to do that. So what we're seeing is an unsustainable impact on housing that's 
gentrification is accelerating in coastal areas and we're continuing to displace the low income and workforce further away from their communities. And as hard as it is to find workers today, it's getting even harder in these areas because people are now having to live hours away from basically service industry jobs, which you think about, it, why would you drive two hours to work uh, fast food at that salary? Yeah. Hmm. Very important, very important topic. We don't, uh, we, we, don't, we don't hear as much about uh, that we should. Um, really fascinating. Um, one, one last question while, while I have you, and then uh, I'll let you go. I really appreciate you spending this time with us. Um, obviously, we, t- we talked about the border, mentioned a little bit about um, sort of drug issues at the border, uh, but we have these other drug issues that uh, I guess maybe don't get uh, sort of the press coverage. I, I sit here in Center City, Philadelphia, and we are now known as having one of the largest open air drug markets uh, in the United States. Um, does the emergency management systems of the United States ever get involved um, in some of these, I we talk about COVID and the public health issue and the overflow. Um, any involvement in emergency management systems and sort of the drug issues that some of these cities are facing in the United States? Not directly, but it's part of the consequences of the recovery response efforts. Um, again, if you've got, again, I, I, I kind of look at this, if you're seeing a large drug trade. You've got other problems. The drug trade is really a symptom of underlying issues. Uh, And I think this is what we keep forgetting. You know, we always look at the problem. We don't look at what the cause was. You know, if we want to solve the drug trade, uh, in some cases, as we're seeing with liberalization of marijuana laws, it's starting to change that environment. But harder drugs, more dangerous drugs, it's a demand signal. Mm -hmm. Uh, What causes that demand signal? And are, are you getting to that? And I think that's, again, why things like uh, court uh, deferral programs for drug users, instead of treating as criminals, say you got a drug problem, let's go deal with the drug problem, not just incarcerate you. Yeah. Uh, but until you address the demand signal, until you address why people are getting addicted to drugs, as we saw with opioids, uh, yeah. over prescriptions, and then we see the availability of low, cheap grade drugs. Uh, again, if we're not talking about why we yeah. have a drug problem, just addressing drug trafficking and drug sales doesn't solve the problem. Got it. I appreciate your insight on that one. Um, Craig, it's, it's always fascinating uh, listening to you and everything that you're involved in, uh, really wishing you the best with all of this um, and everything you're doing, uh, not just in the private sector, but uh, sort of at the at the educational level. Um, for everybody that's uh, going to be listening to uh, this episode or watching on our YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Craig Fugate, uh, Chief Emergency Management Officer of One Concern, former administrator of FEMA. Uh, Craig, once again, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. Thanks for everything you're doing there. And as we say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow through through all these insights and technologies. Really very fascinating. Well, thanks for having me.